talk about and introduce to you Thomas Kuhn's big idea. So the lecture slides are there. I recommend you review them. Um, if you were to take away from this class a couple of big uh, watershed moments, it would be that science and theology are not oppositional. It would be that hyper-Darwinism is an exaggerated ideological interpretation of Darwinism. And number three would be Thomas Kuhn's major thesis that I want to outline here. So those would be the kind of the big three important takeaways from a class like this, as well as a multitude of other interesting sources and figures you could learn about. Um, so Thomas Kuhn wrote a book on scientific revolutions uh, he's a professor of what, what you might call the history of science or the history of the philosophy of science. Um, he wrote and he worked at MIT in Boston and uh, was widely read. The book made him famous. Not a very long book, maybe 150 pages. And it's more like a his history book. It's a kind of history of how science developed from the 16th and 17th centuries, basically to the present. And he says, when you look at science as a discipline, it really only emerged in the 18th and 19th century, really the 19th century, so the 1800s, 1820s up to the present, when um, experiments and lab work got more sophisticated. And so he asks, how did science as a discipline emerge? And then how does science change and evolve theoretically? How do we move from one theory to another? How do we get from Newtonian physics to Einstein's physics? Or how do we get to uh, the Copernican revolution, if you go back to the 16th century, when we see the sun at the center of the universe, whereas we thought it was the earth for the longest time? How do, how the, how do those kind of massive shifts in thinking even occur in the first place? And he says, when we talk about science, since it's empirically based, it, that means it's based on observation and note-taking of observations, okay? Uh, theories are supposed to emerge out of experience or observation of experience. Sorry, one second. And, um, and so, what in fact happens, though, is that's not always the case. It's not always the case that uh, observation drives science, because science needs a framework in which to make sense of observation, does it not? It needs theory. It needs theoretical uh, uh, categories to talk about and discuss what phenomenon they're observing, what it is that the phenomenon is doing. And so he gives a good example of electricity. And he says, in the 1780s and 90s, think of Benjamin Franklin, the famous founding, one of the famous founding fathers of the United States. He was fascinated with electricity and he carried out and conducted several experiments and he had a theory about electricity of being some kind of bits of material. But Thomas Kuhn points out there are about eight or nine other uh, experimenters or scientists of electricity, if I could just put it that way, and they all had their own theories. So there were literally eight or nine competing theories of what the phenomenon electricity is. And the theories all emerged out of empirical observation uh, and testing. And so what eventually happens is one of the theories wins out over time, slowly, and the theories begin to consolidate into one sophisticated, refined theory that is then able to make sense of the testing and the empirical observation. And the empirical observation then refines the theory more. And then the theory makes more sense of the empirical testing. And in fact, the theory can drive how the scientist okay, creates certain tools to be even more precise in testing empirical data. And so it's, in fact, the theory often will tell the scientist what kind of tools and microscopes should even be created or, or manufactured in order to be used in very precise observation of the data or of the phenomenon. Okay, and so what happens after a while is that theory becomes the norm. So this is where Thomas Kuhn comes up with the idea of normal science. It becomes 
what he calls, and this is the all-important term for him, a paradigm. It has its own internal logic and theoretical grounding. It has its own testing tools it's created. And it has its own meaning scheme in which data makes sense to it. And the paradigm is then established and it becomes part of what you might call a science textbook. Now you have a textbook theory on what electricity is after a few decades of several competing theories winnowing down to one. And Kuhn says that's not as objective and neutral a process as you think. Science is a human um, activity. It's, um, it's therefore flawed and always in development and evolution. And he says, how does that actually happen, though? How do we move from one theory or paradigm of electricity to, say, a newer one, which happened in the late 19th century, in which we see that electricity is something like photons, uh, streams of particles, or waves. Um, clearly, I don't know my electricity theory. But um, so Kuhn says this normal science is paradigm, okay, just a kind of self-enclosed meaning scheme here. Uh, after a while, experiences or undergoes what you call an anomaly, something that doesn't make sense to it. It can't make sense of some kind of observation. And the observation creates an anomaly so that the theory has to adjust to account for the anomaly, okay? And an anomaly is just something that happens in the observation or in the data that doesn't fit within the paradigm. And the paradigm has to expand and adjust. And that's what scientists do. They mop up, they clean up their paradigm, they make it more refined and more precise and more detailed. And after a while, it takes care of the anomaly. But what happens when there's so many anomalies that the paradigm can't adjust and we need a whole new paradigm, something completely new, totally different theoretical bearing, uh, or even just one anomaly that just cannot go away unless we shift from one paradigm to a new paradigm. This is what Thomas Kuhn calls a crisis in the discipline of science. It could be in biology, it could be in physics, it could be in um, uh, cognitive science, it can be in any discipline of science that's rooted in the scientific method. After a while, the theoretical sophistication of the paradigm runs its course because the tools have gotten so precise that it can't account for all these amazing observations we're making about, about the world around us. So when that happens, a crisis occurs and a new paradigm emerges, okay? But it does not emerge easily because scientists have been teaching maybe one theory or one paradigm for years, maybe decades, and it's established in textbooks. Okay, think of the electricity theory. Maybe there's been a theory for 150 years on electricity. Or think about Newtonian physics that was dominant for about 200 years. <clears throat> then we changed from Einstein. And that kind of paradigm shift is violent and uncomfortable for scientists who build their whole career on one theory or one paradigm. And so Thomas Kuhn then says, actually, science okay, does not easily switch over in the midst of the crisis to a new paradigm. He says it actually leads to an existential crisis of the scientists themselves within the community. Um, and he says <clears throat> this is a painful shift in which scientists have to be converted to the new paradigm, and it's not obvious that many of them will. And he says many scientists will not admit they're wrong, and they will stick to the old theory no matter what, no matter how much evidence points to the opposite. Uh, this is a quote from, from Kuhn. He says, <clears throat> if the paradigm, the new paradigm, is destined to win its fight, the number and strength of persuasive arguments in favor of it will increase. More scientists will then be converted, and the exploration of the new paradigm will go on and become more careful. Gradually, the number of experiments, instruments, articles, and books based upon the new paradigm will multiply. Still, more men and women convinced of the new view's fruitfulness will adopt the new mode of practicing normal science until at last only a few elderly holdouts will remain. Okay? So the point here is that a new paradigm then, after a while, becomes established in the textbook because new textbooks are written, the new paradigm is established, and it becomes now the norm or the normal science paradigm.
<clears throat> and then science then will say after a few decades, another crisis will happen, and then a new paradigm must emerge to displace that one, and the, the painful existential conversion process happens all over again. And apparently that's fairly regular in science. And I just want to end with this, that this big idea here that Kuhn is saying is, is claiming is suggesting that we need to take away is that science is not just based on raw data and evidence. It's not objective. It's often very much a subjective process in which persuasive evidence doesn't always make sense within the old paradigm, so how can they make sense of it at all? They don't have a meaning scheme for it. And they need a new meaning scheme, but the new meaning scheme is so um, so crude because it's so new, right? It's not fine-tuned yet that many scientists just look at new theories with suspicion. And they and often new theories are proposed by younger scientists in their late 20s and early 30s, which Thomas Kuhn does in fact say, because they have the kind of courage to break out of the old paradigm. They haven't been teaching the old paradigm for years or decades. They haven't published on the old paradigm very much. And so the kind of fresh look at data that requires a fresh theory often emerges with uh, younger scholars. And the last point related to that is that science is often based on, and this is one of the last slides, aesthetic uh, considerations. This mean, aesthetic means beauty. The aesthetics of, of a scientific theory is very important. Is it elegant? Have you ever heard that in science? Scientists care about an elegant or simple theory. Doesn't mean it's correct or objectively true, it just means and it explains more simply the data than another theory does. So let's go with that one. But the fact that they have aesthetic or elegant, you know, elegant as a criteria is bizarre. That's not a scientific criterion, if I've ever heard one. Scientists will talk about that often, that we need an elegant or clean theory. Um, and again, this isn't to critique science as a discipline saying we should get rid of science, but just to humble science a little bit. Thomas Kuhn is saying science is a human phenomenon that develops, it has its own disciplinary crises, it takes time to evolve, and often not everybody evolves with it. And sometimes the new theories are just that, they're just a better way of making sense of uh, data and data sets. And, uh, and they will too have to undergo anomalies and change. And the book is fascinating. I'm not doing justice to the book because it brings up so many historical details and and signposts and references and makes its case very strongly. And it was a bit of a landmark book. I recommend you read it. And we'll see you, I hope, next week.